So a quick video today. If you've been interested in film for a while, you've probably heard of the inciting incident. But what is it and why is it important? Well first, why don't I show you an example? Your mission is to proceed up the Nung River in a Navy patrol boat. <clears throat> Pick up Colonel Kurtz's path at New Mung Ba. Follow it, learn what you can along the way. When you find the Colonel, infiltrate his team by <clears throat> whatever means available and terminate the colonel's command. In Apocalypse Now, Captain Willard is called to HQ and given a mission to sail down the river and assassinate a rogue colonel, who in fairness is a bit crazy. You're neither. You're an errand boy. And that is what the inciting incident is. It launches the story's action and sends the protagonist on a journey. But it's always this simple. In this video, we'll use Ex Machina to explore why the inciting incident doesn't always need to be this clear cut. But firstly, let's see how long it takes to get to the inciting incident in Ex Machina. Whoa, that was quick. Within 20 seconds of the movie, he wins the contest and the main plot is launched. This is something that we rarely see in film. It is often recommended that screenwriters place their inciting incident within the first 20 to 30 pages, so by around the 25 minute mark. This is so the viewer can get a feel for the character's situation and begin bonding with the character, so we actually care about them over the course of the movie. Ex Machina rejects this, to such an extent that we don't even know the protagonist's name before the inciting incident. So why does this work? This is because Ex Machina does not operate in one singular inciting incident. Ex Machina uses a storytelling technique known as the Deferred Call. This is when we get another inciting incident later in the story. So why should we, as filmmakers, know about this technique? Well, to put it simply, it allows us to keep the viewer in a state of ambiguity for a large portion of the movie. Let's take a look at Ex Machina again. We know he's won a competition and is going to be inhabiting a world out with his own simple life. We know very little about him or the details of the competition, because we don't need to in this moment. The real inciting incident comes 15 minutes later. Oh, so, do you know what the Turing test is? Yeah, I know what the Turing test is. It's when a human interacts with a computer. And if the human doesn't know they're interacting with a computer, the test is passed. And what does the past tell us? that the computer has artificial intelligence. Are you building an AI? I've already built one. And when we consider normal story structure, this makes sense, right? We now know what we think the plot is going to hinge on. Will the AI pass the test? Thus, this is the quest of the movie. And if you look back at the movie as a whole, you could probably argue that this is the case. However, based on our definition, is this here not the real inciting incident? You're wrong. Wrong about what? Nathan. In what way? He isn't your friend. Excuse me? I'm sorry. If I, I don't understand. You shouldn't trust him. You shouldn't trust anything he says. This launches the real quest of the movie of who Caleb should trust, Nathan or the AI. So what we have is three separate inciting incidents which launch the quest of the movie. So if we look at when the inciting incident should come, in a formulaic sense, one of our options is 25 minutes too early, another is 15 minutes too early, and one is 10 minutes too late. So after the next film you watch, consider whether it uses one inciting incident or multiple. And if you are a filmmaker, don't be afraid to experiment with your scripts and reject the notion of one singular inciting incident or the fact you need a long setup to make a compelling movie.